Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. I've just had a great chat with Professor Sam Macora from the University of Bologna in Italy. He's an expert on the psychobiology of endurance performance and fatigue. So, you know, up till now on the podcast, we've mainly been thinking about more of sort of physiological parameters, uh, metabolic factors in the muscle, the liver, etc. Here we're talking about rating of perceived exertion or perception of effort and how that determines your um, exercise performance, whether it's your pacing during a, an event or whether it's more like a time to exhaustion. So when you're hanging on for dear life, you know, during a race, your rating of perceived exertion is what affects this. So we talk about what can modify your rating of perceived exertion. So a big one is endurance training you have a lower rating of perceived exertion at the same workload, but also things like caffeine, which can lower your rating of perceived exertion, and mental fatigue, which can, can increase your rating of perceived exertion. So I think you'll find this really interesting, so stick around. Hi, Sam. Welcome to Inside Exercise. How are you? I'm okay. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, you said you're a bit of a you're a bit of a night owl because normally when I do someone in Europe, it's it's like my afternoon and their morning, but you're, it's like nine thirty or something for you at night. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm still I'm still it's it's in there are some people going in Italy. They go out at this time of of the evening to exactly. eat. So it's not all, That's true. We're not as bad as the Spanish. I mean, we don't go that late, but yeah, it's it's no problem. I'm uh, I'm still. Um, awake <laughs> so you don't you, don't, you didn't have a siesta earlier than day no a, no, like no, no. <laughs> at a pack, pack, pack day actually but uh, oh, i'm okay. always happy to do podcasts also to you know to to translate the science to you know to the general public which i think it's uh, very important for us academics to do so that's why i'm i'm glad to to help out when i can oh, good man thank you and this is a good one to have for various reasons but especially i'm sort of like more a muscle metabolism kind of guy and you know, we've done liver metabolism and various other things, but we haven't probably gone above here that that often. Um, although it does get a mention. So I had Mark Hargraves on last last uh, time, and we were talking about carbohydrate metabolism, and he, he actually mentioned it's quite a nice lead up. He mentioned quite a few times about sensual aspects of you know swirling carbohydrate around in your mouth and and some things that might come up later on. Mm -hmm. So okay, so we're talking about psychobiology of endurance performance. Um, why don't we talk about how did you actually get to that sort of area and become a big name as you are? Yeah. And, um, and then we'll talk about what is actually psychobiology of exercise. Yeah. Mm. So how I got into it was, uh, so my PhD was had nothing to do with this. So I was at University of Wales in Bangor, not Wales. And I did my PhD on how to treat uh, muscle atrophy in rheumatoid arthritis patients. Right. So, you know, I was looking at body composition, muscle mass, strength, function, because my, my background, I did my uh, physical education degree in Milan, undergraduate degree, then I did my master's degree in exercise physiology in the States, and also Wisconsin, La Crosse, and then I did my PhD in Bangor. So I kind of, okay, from sports science PE, but more with the physiological focus, and that was, my PhD was like that, but I noticed that one of the things that really bothered my patients was this fatigue. And not the fatigue, the muscle fatigue that we normally discuss in, in exercise physiology, but the, the, the feeling of fatigue, the sensation, the, um, the perception of fatigue. Um, and then also, unfortunately, uh, my mom, uh, she got like a very um, sudden disease then in, in three days she went from perfectly healthy to needing dialysis oh. and dialysis is something that also has a lot of <laughs> muscular cardiovascular consequences but uh, a big one is is this feeling of fatigue as well um especially so on the days of dialysis you know uh they're stuck in, in the hospital and then the day after the eyes they're, they're knackered so yeah. it's a uh, so and also I realized that this thing is cannot be simply fitness because it can go up and down very quickly. So one day you're okay, one day you're bad. And so I thought, hmm, I need to, it, it's a feeling, it's a sensation. So it's a psychological, as the psychologist would call it, construct, a phenomenon. 
And CERT has to do something normally things that change quickly has to do with the nervous system, right? Of course, is is mm-hmm. is generating the nervous system, but also that the how quickly it changes uh, it, it suggests that, that the cause is not just a cause of something going on in the periphery, it can be something really within the nervous system. So I, I, need, I need to go to the experts in this, right? <laughs> so after my PhD, <clears throat> actually it was funny, I also bought a, 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 study, a, a book about proteomics. I really, I was at the, you know, I can either go from physiology into more kind of molecular biology kind of stuff, like a lot of, you know, our colleagues have done, or and that was more <laughs> dangerous, I guess. I could go completely the opposite way and go into psychology. And that's why they started to do, motivated by these experiences that I've just told you about. And so I decided in my first sabbatical to uh, spend it um, instead of going somewhere exotic, <laughs> stay in Bangkok uh, and go to the School of Psychology in Bangkok because it's a very school of psychology, but also very strong in cognitive neuroscience. Because I wanted to be involved in... So uh, studying psychology, learning psychology, be involved in as many um, experiments uh, as possible, you know, going to an fMRI, magnetic stimulation, EEG, um, also the psychological techniques. Um, so that's what I did. So, and I came out uh, in a way psychobiological, <laughs> meaning, um, you know, trying to integrate psychology and their theory is the way of you know, uh, thinking about the mind and the brain into, into exercise physiology. But psychobiology, I haven't, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, I haven't invented the term, it's, 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 it's a discipline in a way. But the reason why I decided to, you know, to call also some of my, my theoretical framework, the psycholo- psychobiological model, because I think it shows something that, uh, first of all, that uh, as I will explain later, I guess that, what, what we are, I'm trying to explain, which is that endurance, performance, or fatigue, more generically, um, as a psychological phenomenon, but as a biological substrate. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, and the the two things are not separated; they are one word. One is just a. a, a there was a, 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 a in, in general by physiology. Uh, they said psychology is a special phase of brain physiology. And I like that uh, very much. Is is unfortunately, you know, a lot of especially in, in physiology, if something is measured subjectively, is seen as a poor man science or not even scientific mm-hmm. at all. Uh, which you know, I ch- I was a little bit like that myself, but I I changed my mind and you know, uh, actually <laughs> doing psychological experiments is very tough. It's very difficult because you're dealing with something that can be affected by so many things. So the, con- the experimental control has to be very tight. So. So yeah, so that's where where it started, and it was a risky decision, but I guess it paid off because it enabled me to come up with some very original studies, which have been well received. Uh, so I cannot yeah. complain. Yes, yeah, so I have to say, as I was talking to you about before we started, I, I'd, I'd heard, of course, about these sort of debates and things, but I hadn't really looked into it before this. So it's good to have a bit of a look, but but you know, not too much, so we can sort of I can kind of learn as we go along. So. You know, you mentioned fatigue, and unfortunately with your mother, and obviously that's a very different thing. And we had a bit of a, an email chat about how I'd, I'd had sort of longish COVID. I don't call it long COVID because it's like three months longish. or something, but, but it was kind of like eight weeks or something where I, until I felt kind of normal. And, and you said, oh, that's interesting because that's a, a fatigue. So why don't we just talk a little bit about fatigue? Because naturally that feeling of lethargic and, and tired is very different to, you know, riding a bike, you know, to... The other, you know, like the time, the classic sort of time to exhaustion where you sit on a mm-hmm. bike and you go as long as you can. Mm-hmm. I've, I've done both of those now and they're very different. So why don't we yes. just talk a little bit about... There is a connection though. There is yeah. a connection because what you described is feeling of, you know, slugginess, tiredness, and you can feel it at rest as well. So at rest, you don't need, and you just feel tired. And however, the kind of fatigue which is, I think, it's one of the psychological manifestation of what we call fatigue, I guess. The problem, the problem with the term fatigue is that we use the same term to mean very different things. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, some people think that, ah, because we call this thing fatigue and this other thing fatigue, because they're called the same, then we can kind of maybe studying this kind of fatigue will inform the other kind of, no. So mm-hmm. it's a very imprecise term because 
um, it's about different phenomena and sometimes these phenomena are not associated at all. So obviously in, 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 in physiology, we study a lot. Well, in the old days, we studied as uh, the time of fatigue or the, the, when, when you get exhausted in a time to exhaustion test, that's fatigue. I mean, but that's very few people do that. I mean, that, that they conceive fatigue in that way. Now fatigue uh, is, is conceived in physiology as the exercise reduction, exercise induced reduction in maximum force or power. Mm -hmm. or any other measure of performance induced by, you know, by prolonged exercise, by, by exercising for a certain amount of time. And uh, usually, me usually measured by, you know, a maximum voluntary contraction before and after a uh, fatiguing bout of exercise. And so, and that's, and then, and then we can divide in central fatigue and peripheral fatigue, uh, depending on where the mechanism of this exercise induced reduction muscle force is, which starts one confusion because when people talk about central fatigue because it's to do with the central nervous system some people put include in this in that term things like the reduced drive to the muscle during maximum voluntary effort which is a purely a motor let's call it motor dysfunction induced by exercise together with things like motivation <laughs> <laughs> or, mm. or the perception of effort, which are one is, I mean, they're, they're not the same thing. The, the fact, mm. It's like saying that, I don't know, that, that memory is the same as uh, smell. I mean, they're both in the central nervous system, but they're, they're not <laughs> the same thing. There may what be did some you say? Sorry, I actually missed that. It's like I don't know, so memory. What? I know you're oh, working memory. memory. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, 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 and I don't know, the sense of smell. They're oh, both smell. in the central yes, nervous yes, yes. system. Yes. It's like we call the work, uh, is, is, it would be like calling smell, the sense of smell, both working memory and the sense of smell. I mean, it would be very mm -hmm. confusing, right? Yes. <laughs> it's two different things. So I try to avoid things like center fatigue and even fatigue, but I don't think I gave up trying, and some people tried and failed miserably. So I, I'm not even trying to, 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 to try to find a unifying definition of fatigue. Uh, my suggestion to the listener, especially scientists, but also, you know, in, interested uh, uh, lay people, when you talk, when somebody talks about fatigue or you read about fatigue, ask them, how did you measure it? Or go and look in the paper how they measured it. Because um, uh, that will tell you exactly what they're talking about because it just somebody tells you, oh, I'm doing something about fatigue is it, very imprecise. You never know exactly what they're talking about. So it's very important yeah. to define it. And what I'm more interested in is not so much this feeling of fatigue when that you can experience even when you are not doing anything, but is the is perception of effort. And again, mm -hmm. some people think that perception of effort is the perception of fatigue no so I'm a, I'm a big guy glenn i don't know what's your background in but being an energy metabolism maybe more of an endurance kind of guy Endur no? yeah i was in yeah All right. endurance. so yeah. i think i you know i weigh under than 10 kilos and so if you leave me you probably give me at this you know zero to ten rp escape or me give me i don't know an eight or something right mm -hmm. <laughs> That doesn't mean you're fatigued. It means that I'm heavy and you're not a strong man. Okay. So perception of effort per se is not a perception of fatigue. What I also sometimes define as fatigue, uh, which is the one I'm interested in, which is the one also that uh, is experienced by these patients, for example, and probably also experienced when you had this longish COVID, is a, a, a an increase in perception of effort, which is associated, of course, by definition, with doing something. Mm -hmm. So it's the feeling of effort that you have when you do something that is higher than normal. Okay, so when you start a marathon, when you start running at, I don't know what your pace was, if you did a marathon, whatever. It, but uh, it was all right. It was all right. I, I was a, I was about a 31 and a half minute 10K runner. All right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So but you, you start so, the marathon at a certain speed, if I ask you the RP is equal to 10, you give me maybe, I don't know, a three. Mm -hmm. The same speed, or sometimes, unfortunately, even a slower speed at the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. If I ask you fatigue, you give me a zero to 10, maybe you give me a nine or a 10 even at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I compare you, so your perception of effort for the same speed, let's say, you've been able to, perfect pace, you kept the speed all the time. Mm -hmm. 
the perception of effort at the end of the marathon is much higher than at the beginning for the same physical task. For me, that's fatigue. It's this higher, and of course, this normally occur progressively, although you can have some, you know, some crisis in the middle, but it's when you are, you feel higher effort than normal, or than fresh, let's say, uh, doing a task. And this happens also with, with the patient. So when you were, if you, if you try to do a, <laughs> I don't know, your usual run, when you mm -hmm. had a long, longish going, maybe you didn't even try, but it would have, it would have felt much more effortful than normal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an interesting thing as well. Just, I'm still trying to think about comparing the types of fatigue because, is it is it right that the fatigue you feel, you know, as a dialysis patient or while you've got COVID, et cetera, is 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 a very different thing in that your brain is actually sort of wanting you not to exit? Because the last thing I wanted to do, I had this great streak, the best I ever had, 255 days in a row of cycling. And then COVID, gone. And yeah. and I didn't even want to get on. So so what happened was, is it my brain is actually trying to, you know protect itself which it also does you know if you're exercising in the heat and you're pushing mm -hmm. yourself like crazy it's mm -hmm. trying to protect itself but is mm -hmm. the brain actually tr like saying dude do not exercise <laughs> the the answer is yes and no it's yes but it's not in the way that most people in exercise physiology think uh which has been i guess well because it makes sense i guess and also because of the center governor model which was although you know uh, i'm a big a very, I'm very critical of it. I've been very critical of it in the past. At least he had the, the the merit of starting to introduce exercise physiology to okay, oh, there is a brain as well, <laughs> and it's not just yeah. about mm -hmm. uh, central fatigue doing muscle volume contraction, something to do also with endurance. So in that respect, has been very, very important. But it is as the model, I think, is as bad as it was important historically. <laughs> and one of the things is that it assumes that, well, at the beginning, there was not even perception of effort in the model because actually the original model, which at least made sense from a coherence point of view, <laughs> it didn't have perception of effort in it because in theory, it, it wouldn't need it because the idea was orig the original idea. Um, was that there was this center governing the brain that when it either perceive or even anticipates that you might get you know too too intense or too prolonged exercise so that you may damage yourself it will directly reduce the recruitment of your locomotor muscle to slow you down or stop you mm. so if 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 it was true that that this center govern or this protector in the brain could Directly assess and 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 and, and control uh, the recruiter of locomotor mass. You don't really need the perception of effort. <laughs> it would just slow you down, even without any perception of effort. Then in later in later versions, uh, there has been you know the additional perception of effort together with the the, the red control, which doesn't make any sense. Then it became even just perception. So a big mess there. But one of the key component of the center of model is that whatever it is, the mechanism that is there to protect you during exercise so that you don't basically kill yourself with exercise mm -hmm. acutely during the bout of exercise, okay? I don't think so. I, uh, first of all, because as a scientist, not because um, uh, <laughs> it's not a political opinion, <laughs> is that mm -hmm. indeed you can kill yourself co co in a way, in, in most of the time that can happen consciously, uh, you can kill yourself. Uh, for example, let's say, uh, you know, running uh, in uh, heat, you know, hot and humid condition to the point that you get each shock or, you know, it could, even to the danger, you know, you may even get to, to kill yourself. That's actually a perfect example there <laughs> of the fact that we don't have to set the cover. So we can overcome it. Mm. It's not, it's a perfect example how, because normally, would if it's hot and humid, would you go out and run a marathon? Well, don't no. they say mad, because you um, you were in England for a while there, mad, they say, used to say mad dogs and Englishmen go out and, what's that, what's that? <laughs> no. Only mad dogs and Englishmen run in the midday sun or something. <laughs> no, but you do it because you have a competitive goal. Exactly. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't run. 
a marathon in the hot and humid. You will, you will go in a cocktail bar with the air conditioning, have a frozen pina colada or something. Like that, right? And actually, that's the reason why actually in healthy people, okay, in, in people with other, you know, a health problem, that's a different story. Or sudden death, that's a different story. But in healthy people, the, the all, really, the only way to kill yourself with exercise is, is, is with heat shock, really. Mm -hmm. And that's actually proved the point because, and why not in, uh, why other uh, physiological parameters that are homeostatically controlled and don't, 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 don't you don't know, you cannot kill yourself by going into cardiac, uh, myocardial ischemia if you are healthy. Mm -hmm. It happens, of course, if you have coronary heart disease, because we don't have a central governor that protects us. Indeed, you can get ischemic <laughs> with exercise. That's a good point. But That's the, good the, point. The, yeah. yeah, the reason why you can kill yourself with exercise in the heat is because temperature is one of the homeostatic parameters that is heavily dependent on so-called behavioral regulation of most states. Of course, we have the, you know, autonomic. Uh, subconscious, completely subconscious, autonomic uh, regulation. You know, we sweat, you know, uh, changes in uh, blood flow to the skin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's not enough if you do not change your behavior. So we have the the normally the the heat sense thermal discomfort motivates us not to run in the heat unless mm -hmm. there is a very good reason for it. And 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 so you have two goals. One is conscious goal to reduce thermal discomfort, which means stopping running and going to the pina colada cocktail bar, mm -hmm. or finish the out or win the out or whatever is your competitive goal and ignore. So you have two goals and one, the competitive one, offset the other one. And that can lead, of course, to problems because you're not supposed to, from a homeostatic point of view, running in the heat is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's, it's if it, there's no survival reason to do that. So that actually tells you that is the it's 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 very rare and I don't think that that's the protecting you during the bout of exercise that's not the function. I think the function is um, has to do with energy homeostasis over periods of weeks, months, if not even years. So is is to pre is there to prevent you from spending energy, which when we evolved was very scarce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When is there's no good reason for it, okay. and not because acutely is a problem. You're gonna I don't know uh, go into rigor mortis like, <laughs> which is yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. Tim Knox was saying total yeah. total craziness. And mm -hmm. it's not that. Is that. You, if, if you spend energy and you don't have a lot of energy intake, you can get, okay, first you can get in what we also can see in Samati, you know, the relative energy deficiency syndrome, mm -hmm. which can, you know, you can get to in, in all sorts of troubles, right? Immunodeficiency, uh, deficiency suppression and other problems. But also over, that can happen also in, you know, within a few weeks, few days, few weeks, depends on. But then over months or years, that will determine your level of body fat, right? Mm -hmm. And your level of, we are very, we are now concerned with obesity, but when we evolved, obesity wasn't an issue because we, <laughs> what, what was the issue was not to mm -hmm. get too lean. Mm -hmm. Because if you have an injury or an infection, we are going back to COVID, mm -hmm. and you are too lean, but because of the injury infection, you, 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 you are not active, you cannot, you know, get your food. Somebody who is very, very lean, somebody who doesn't have perception of effort, and spend energy unnecessarily is more likely to die than somebody who had this perception of effort and therefore was more uh, more more conservative with this energy spend because of the perception of effort so i think it's homeostasis by no homeostasis during exercise is energy homeostasis over a much longer period of time and that's also because this perception of effort or even the expectancy you learn it and the expectancy of this perception effort inform your decision and usually makes you decide to do something that is either no, uh, less energy demanding or not doing it at all. Or, okay, I do it, but only because there is a very good reason to do it. I don't know, for, for example, getting food. So it's, it's a yes and no, right? Um, okay. 
So, so I've just I, I know I've, I've read up a bit on this on your psychobiological biological model, uh, and there's like these five dot points, and I know perception of effort is the big mm -hmm. one, yeah. Yeah. But then there's other things we've touched on, so I thought I might just mention them, because the other one is is, is potential motivation. So that's what you're saying. If if you want to win a gold medal, or you know you want to get, get your uh, little little medallion for finishing your marathon or whatever, that's the motivation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, but then you've got, I just wanted to sort of get this out and get get my head around it. Knowledge of the distance time to cover and the distance remaining. So we've we've talked about that a bit, right? So you're, you're saying when you start a marathon, it's easy. Mm -hmm. So there isn't much of a problem with keeping going. Towards the end, it's harder. And, and, and your knowledge and your pre, and the other one is the previous experience. So I guess the fact is if you've done a marathon before and you, and you go, oh, this is going to hurt. It's going to affect your. Why don't you just explain all this stuff? A bit okay. more, yeah. That's that's the model uh, applied because basically, the model becomes increase, increase, increasingly complex in terms of numbers of psychological factors required to explain the behavior, depending on the complexity of the behavior. So, for a time to exhaustion test, mm -hmm. which by the way. You know, I had the pleasure to work with uh, one of the best professional cycling coach uh, okay. in Italy, and therefore in the world, who died unfortunately some years ago, brain cancer, who once told me, apart from the, the, very, the very top guy, because a lot of people say that the time to exhaustion test, because there's no uh, self-regulation of, of, of pace, nice. is not uh, ecologically valid, it's not a good measure of, perf of endurance performance. I totally disagree, but it's not just me, it's also this one of the best professional uh, cyclist coaches ever. Um, I mean, he was coaching the, the Mape with for 10 years, was one of the best professional cycling team. And he told me, okay, may, maybe for the, the the top guy, but for everybody else, every race is a time to exhaust him. Yeah, you're holding on. Yeah, exactly. Holding on, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, to the, with the best mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe try to, you know, maybe hoping that he will give up or trying to maybe to do a sprint finish at the end or something, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, so of course the time to exhaustion there is not at a fixed pace, the pace can, but you're trying to hold on, right? Mm -hmm. um, or when you are trying to do a, 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 your personal best, you have, you know, you know, okay, for me to, to do, a, you know, my personal best, I need to keep this pace. Exactly. Uh, so you and try, when, you try to keep it for as long. Hopefully exactly. it's going to. And when people run a marathon, they usually try and pace themselves, right? Because you know, it's not smart to go, you know, really fast and then die. So, yeah. so that's basically you're trying to go at that same speed as yeah. long as you can. But then if you ask a child, if you tell a child, okay, let's go around a mountain, it will, it will <laughs> sprint because he has no idea, right? Okay, I think he has no idea also in terms of distance, or, but also it doesn't have all this memory of how perception of effort changes mm -hmm. over time at different running speeds, etc. Mm -hmm. So as I said, so for time to exhaustion, the two key factors are perception of effort and potential motivation. However, we can even disregard potential motivation, to be honest, when we talk about um, a, a, an athlete in, a, in an important competition, in a, you know, a, to be honest, most competitions, eh? uh, because uh, potential motivation, motivation is, a, is another big word. Potential effort actually refers to a very specific thing, which is the maximum effort that you're willing to exert in order to succeed in the task, mm -hmm. okay? And most of the time, in order to succeed in the task, you need to exert your, to be able to get to motivated enough that if required, you, you do a maximal effort, right? Okay, of, of course, if Kipchoge, goes, you know, uh, <laughs> under two marathon, two hours marathon guy, goes and compete in the, I don't know, provincial marathon, and he yeah. doesn't need to. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. he, but normally in, a, in an important competition, you, you, you have to get your maximum left. So actually we can even get that away. So the key factor is the perception of effort that you have at, at the given speed and how quickly it increases over time. Mm -hmm. yes. that, that of course will the, 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 the model says okay assuming that you are happy to, to, to give your maximal effort basically you will uh, your time to exhaustion will, 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 uh, will end when your perception of effort will reach what you perceive as to be your maximal effort okay uh, assuming of course they are willing to do that but I said let's assume that so the, the perception of effort and how quickly increases over time 
doing at a given speed we determine for how long basically you can keep that speed mm -hmm. then of course when you do a time trial you also need to know if i tell you okay we are doing a time trial and i don't tell you how long how long it's gonna mm -hmm. be for <laughs> How can you That's choose your be pace? Very frustrating. Yes. Exactly. I mean, it's mm -hmm. almost these things I'm saying are, are almost um, so obvious, but sometimes we that, that's a, a psychological and, and actually a complex one <laughs> knowledge and memory. So you need to know uh, how long is the is the race. And uh, you have to keep that in your working memory. Uh, if people have memory problems, is, 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 is actually a very complex thing. But of course, for us, it's not, we deal with healthy people. Then what you do, you need to know, of course, um, how, how much distance you have covered or how much distance is. For example, if I put you on a treadmill, mm -hmm. I tell you, even if I tell you, okay, now you're going to run for 42 kilometers, but I cover the the, space. the information about the mm. distance. Uh, distance. Do you think you'll be able to pace yourself optimally? No. Nope. No. Nope. Because what you do, basically, I think what you do is you compare, okay, how much is left of the race mm -hmm. with how much you think you can, whether you think you can keep the current speed for the remaining distance. And that prediction, which is a conscious one, not subconscious one at the center of. So if you think that you can keep it on but only that one, you will you will, you won't change your pace. If you keep, oh, actually, I, I think I can keep even a faster one, you will you will increase your mm -hmm. speed. If you think, oh no, which is probably most of the time that what happens. If you think, oh no, I, I started too fast. I'm, I'm forget it. I'm not going to be able to keep this until <laughs> the end. I'm going to reduce. But what you do, you compare your prediction of, is a predicted time to exhaustion, if you like, mm -hmm. with what is left. And then you, uh, of course, you you pace yourself accordingly. Um, it's it's more like, it's like, but it's more like it's, you don't even think in that way. Mm -hmm. It's like you think, okay, can I keep this for another, whatever, 10 kilometers or not? So it's more, it's, it's basically self-efficacy. Is a is your perceived ability of, of completing the task, which is you know to keep going at the speed for the remaining distance. And then you, of course, if you think you're not able to, you're gonna slow down. You think you can even do better, you will go up, etc. So that's the, if you think about most competition, which are not time trials, I mean, many, but most competition are uh, max star competition. You compete against somebody else, right? In that case, then you have ad additional psychological constructs. One is, of course, the behavior of the opponent. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if for some reason all your opponents are really bad <laughs> and they cannot keep up <laughs> with you at all. You may not even, you know, you will pace yourself different from if you know uh, compared to somebody who is really challenging to you. So the behavior of the opponents goes into the equation, into the model, and also normally also the strategy it could be individual strategy or, or, or um, even sometimes you know cycling for that team strategy. Uh, so it from a psychological point of view, something that looks almost a purely physical thing. <laughs> it's actually very complex from a psychological point of view. And then another thing I always say, and that's why I was surprised that many psychologists in a way now it's better, it's, it's, it's changes, it's changed actually. Uh, there are very excellent psychologists, the sports psychologists really doing a lot of good work like um, Noel Brick and Calame, et cetera, on, on endurance sports. But the, 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 it was quite ignored for a while. They, they prefer to do things like skill sports, you know, things where the, the cognitive and, if you like, uh, the, the psychological aspects of it is more evident. But I always thought, actually, think about it. When you do an endurance task, you have so much time to think. Oh, yeah. And yeah. The, 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 we call it self-talk. Uh, all this thinking can affect your performance. And you have a lot of time to think. <laughs> so... Even by realizing that, you probably say, mm, I should study this psychologically, not only from a cardiovascular or metabolic point of view, right? Well, I keep having thoughts that I, I, I think so I want to talk, bring about, uh, talk about, and then I think, oh, I don't want to forget. So how about right now we talk about that a little bit so I don't forget later. So mm -hmm. one of the dot points I sort of had to talk about was, is it better to zone in or zone out? And I'm sure mm -hmm. it's different for different people. So I mm -hmm. saw, um, what's his name? Um, uh, De Ghent 
Marcus de Ghent, he's a, one of the Tour de France guys. And and it, and it's on Twitter, someone had asked him, you know, what do you do? And it sounded like he just wants to like zone out. Mm -hmm. um, so tries to not think about what he's doing. And then the other extreme is, I know, because I read this at one stage and I tried it, I was doing intervals on the bike and I decided to actually really think about exactly what I could feel. So mm -hmm. the, it was indoors, so the, the, the air, the, the fan even on my face, but the, actually think about the pain in the, my quads. And mm -hmm. it, strangely enough, it actually, it, the time was up quickly. So anyway, mm -hmm. I'm not sure like the, the pros and cons and of zoning okay. in versus so, zoning out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The problem uh, which happens often in psychology, the pros and cons are also different people. Also, also I guess different stages of a race, depending on what kind of race you're doing. But obviously in the Tour de France, like a long race is. So, um, well, the one of the, cl the classic and for a long time, the only really kind of big and famous study of psychology applied to endurance sports was um, a study published kind of late 70s, early 80s um, about the, the, the associative dissociative thinking during marathons. And what they found that in the kind of, let's say, low level marathon runners, the strategy mostly used uh, used or that, that naturally was this dissociative thinking. Try to, because we know that if you distract yourself, um, which easier to do during kind of low intensity, as I said, more intense, during very high intensity, it's be difficult to distract yourself from the, all the feelings that you have. But during less, like, like a marathon, it's relatively low intensity, you can, um, we know, for example, study with music or this, you know, uh, focusing attention on something external, something else, it does reduce the perception of effort. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, you, you think, okay, that's great. That's what I want to do. Then I guess we're going to talk about that because the key to improve performance is reducing perception of effort. The problem is that that would work, for example, if you do some sort of a, maybe a time to exhaustion test, but doing a marathon, especially if you're a high level athlete where you are you're not just trying to finish <laughs> hold on let's see if i can finish <laughs> exactly <laughs> the mountain the, where okay it's probably better to dissociate if you are running a marathon really at the limit of your capacity you cannot distract yourself all the time because then you wouldn't be able to pace yourself up you, you may actually go too slow or, or too quick mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and therefore using and that's what they find in the, the high level marathon runners they tend to use more associative thinking because i think they need to let's use a later meridio but to, you know pay attention to to especially perception of effort in order to pace what we were discussing earlier to be able to pace things yeah pace yourself which is not an easy thing at all because it's not automatic and regulated by central and it's something you have to do consciously and even you know it's not something that you can learn you can get better at it but it's not easy also because things can change you in the race you can feel in a different way it's, it's complicated the longer the the the, the 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 event the more difficult it is to pace yourself and um so you need to keep that but i think you, especially during long-term race, you may be some, some stages of the race where, you know, you are, especially in a more strategic sport like, like cycling, where I'm mean, okay, you know, you're going to take a certain space, so you want to take your mind off it so that you, you're not going to get so fatigued by it. But, of, but I think even that guy that you mentioned, uh, he, I realize he, it's Thomas he, de Ghent. Thomas de Ghent. Oh, Thomas de Ghent. He, okay. he was the famous breakaway expert. Okay. So he would I'm pretty always sure, do breakaways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that when he had to, to pace himself optimally, then he would he would have paid attention to how he felt before exactly. a breakaway to decide mm -hmm. whether it was a good idea or not yeah. to break away. So, yeah, it it the answer it depends, I guess, um, on on the stage of the race, the level of of the athlete, and exactly what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I've got a question here from Twitter from a guy Tom Hughes. This is a bit of an interesting one. If you were an athlete and you were struck with amnesia. So, you know, this thing you mm. we were talking about how you've got your past experiences and things that, mm -hmm. that affect how you pace yourself mm. and you were struck with amnesia, would you go faster or slower? I.e., does the conscious brain hold us back by reminding us of our limits uh, or push us by reminding us of our achievements? Or would you do the same? I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. My thoughts would be in a, in a normal competition where you, you know, pace, 
pace, you need to pace yourself, I think the performance would be worse because without, you know, memory of the relationship between speed, time, and perception of effort, it would be nearly impossible to. You be like a child which starts very fast, yes. you know, yes. almost like a sprint. And we know that you know starting very, very fast a marathon, for example, is not a great idea. <laughs> Too fast for for your capacity. So I think it, 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 there will be a decline in in performance. However, that doesn't mean that because there is also another side of the question, right? That maybe your beliefs based on your previous experiences can hold you back, that's that's true. Uh, in psychology, we call it self-efficacy, uh, which in sports psychology is one of the best predictors of performance. <laughs> so people, it's a bit, um, I think there is some, there may be some co-correlations there, but if 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 the self-efficacy self is, is, is low, <laughs> of course, you're, you're not gonna perform very well. However, it, it I think it also depends on, uh, and I think that's the primary thing, is how you feel when you do the the, the task, uh, running a marathon or whatever. If I had the magic pill, that would be my experiment, not so much the amnesia. If I had a, a magic pill, in a way I do have it, but it's not that magic, but still. But if I had the magic pill, they really, really reduce a lot your perception of effort. Mm -hmm. Would you... Um, perform better? And the answer is actually yes, because we do have it and it's called caffeine. And actually the effect of caffeine on the, on the RPE scale is, is less than one point on the scale. And still it's that effect on perception, effort, which is oh, now wow. has been recognized mm -hmm. to be the, the, the reason why caffeine works. It's not so much about sparing glycogen bios, making you oxidize more fat. The original, the, the original idea for the ergogenic effect of fat yeah. of caffeine was based on the what I call the physiological model of endurance. So you know, and the energetic side of it, you know, this uh, which has been proven to be not correct. And and now there is is the CNS effect that reduced, which by reducing perceptual value increase your performance. So. That's a proof, but there are many other experiments that, that we did actually that, that proves that you, if you, because the problem is perception of effort by men, including many physiology, including me, before I really got into these things, was that perception of effort is like an AP phenomenon. In a way, also in the center of animal model, because even when they started to include perception of effort, you always thought, oh, this is the, is the product of the calculation of the center of value. He has already decided when you're going to stop, but somehow I don't understand exactly why. We give it as control of the motor units of your legs. Why? But uh, he somehow also generates this perception of effort so that <laughs> you also have this sensation of fatigue. So even in the center of value, in a way, is an epiphenomenon. And, uh, and it's not. It's devaluable, the limits of performance. So, because if it was just an epiphenomenon, for example, of your, uh, I don't know, your, where you are relative to your lactate threshold, for example, mm. then me changing your perception of effort without changing your lactate threshold, it shouldn't have any effect no. on endurance performance. But it does. Mm -hmm. I can change. If I change your perception, if I make it worse, without changing your physiology, which I did with my mental fatigue studies, you're going to go slower or, or you, you, you will last shorter. If I reduce your perception of effort with caffeine or with some psychological techniques, you will go faster. I, a study that we did was motivational self-talk. Motivational self-talk is not gonna increase your mitochondria suddenly <laughs> during a marathon mm -hmm. or change your metabolism, but it does uh, improve your, uh, reduce your perception of effort, improve your endurance. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's all about perception, that the physiological fit is not important because the best way to reduce perception of effort is actually training and getting fitter. Exactly. Right? We all know that at, you know, when you started, if you're unfit and you, and you try to push, I don't know, 300 watts, 350 watts on a bike, it's gonna feel very, mm -hmm. very hard. When you get, you train, you get much fitter, it's gonna be much easier, right? Exactly. So.
So, you know, I, I did my master's, this is way back in 1989 and 1991 with David Costell. You, you'd obviously mm -hmm. know that name. Of and I, I always think about how interesting, because he was he was onto a lot of things, but back then we were doing, you know, muscle biopsies and all sorts of things and so looking at metabolism. But he would always say that he thought the rating of perceived exertions, the perceived the perception of effort was the main thing that sort of just summed up everything. So brought in, you know, what's your glycogen, what's your, your mental state, what's your glucose. It, it just brought it all together and then decided how you felt and that dictated how you mm -hmm. performed, right? And then mm -hmm. he did a classic study, I'm sure you're aware of, where he um, had people have caffeine or, or, or not, and he just got them to exercise at the same rating of perceived exertion. And that that's exactly what you're saying. I know you've probably taken this much. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, so then they were able to, to exercise without knowing yeah. what the workload was. So they, like mm -hmm. I said, they cover the workload, the power output, and caffeine just made them feel a bit easier. So they're able to, to perform better, uh, better yeah. at the same rating of perceived exertion. So exactly. that's exactly what you're saying. Exactly. It? Yeah. It's very important that we need to conceive perception of effort in, in a psychophysical way. So not as... You, and that's the way I see it. also that's the original way anyway the board so that psychophysics means the relation between a physical stimulus and psychological response and the physical st stimulus although in the context of perceptual efforts no entirely correct calling like that but anyway let's let's um is the workload the power output the speed mm -hmm. whatever that and the perception of effort is the psychological response so you need to think always in terms of the relationship between perception of effort and and the workload what you're trying to do is to either reduce the percentage effort for the same workload so that you can keep it in the end of the <laughs> or which is exactly the same thing if you look at it you know by the relation of these two things increase the power up for the same perception of effort or okay. the speed for the same so is the relationship between perception of effort and speed that you need to change and the best way to change is by training exactly. but the good news is that and that's a big shift, I think, is that if you think the perception of effort is simply an epiphenomenon of you being fitter, then, okay, all, the only thing you can do is getting is becoming fitter. But because it's not, is the mechanism for the increase in perception of effort at the more proximal level, because it determines the behavior hmm, directly, you can change, if you, if you can change perception of effort on the top of being fit, eh, you're going to perform even better. Yes. Yeah, so, be... so it gives you more <laughs> avenue to improve your performance. It's not just a theoretical disquisition. Uh, it's, it, it has applied consequences on how you prepare, how you do things during the race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as you said, the way to reduce your perception of effort at the most is to train. But then once you're actually well trained, then you say, well, what am I going to do about it today? Because you've already, you know, you're already at that point. But that, that's interesting because I guess the reason you, your perception of effort is reduced when you're well trained is more physiological, correct? Because you've got... Well, the, mag the, the perception of effort can... I think you need to... Dis yeah, yeah, of course it's... it's physiological but the byproduct of it obviously is, is psychological so if it, for example if i if 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 you get fitter but somehow i could keep your perception of effort the same as you when you were not fit mm -hmm. you, you perform the same <laughs> so it in, in my model training works because it reduces special effort then we can discuss and understand that that's where there is a lot of complexity of what why when you are fitter you perceive less effort Yes. doing exercise that's a more but from a practical point of view i mean it, it's good to know the mechanisms and it may lead to discovery how to further reduce perception of effort but from a purely practical point of view the good thing is the perception of effort redu uh, sorry uh, training reduces perception of effort why mm -hmm. and how that's very interesting and actually there's no man there are many there are many studies about it about that, actually. Uh, we actually, there are not even many studies about something so obvious, like the fact that perception of effort in the redu uh, is reduced by training. There are very few studies that actually formally studied that. Very yeah, few. It is interesting because, because you know, you always think about even talking about metabolism, that when you're endurance trained, 
we should stipulate we're talking about endurance training here um you know you've got less of a challenge to your homeostasis so your you know your ability to to maintain your even atp adp ratio in the muscle mm -hmm. your muscle glycogen breakdown even your increase in adrenaline in the blood etc everything is less at the same absolute workload but it's interesting because there is more feedback i guess sorry but so then you've got to go at the same relative intensity mm -hmm. right so just make sure people are clear so if you're going at 100 watts untrained and, and trained it's the same absolute workload but it's mm -hmm. going to feel a lot harder for the untrained person so therefore exactly. you've got to it's not exactly perfect but if you go at the same relative intensity so mm -hmm. you know it's the same percentage of your vo2 max then the trained person has to go to higher workload but then they probably have about the same perception of effort. Is that fair to say? Of course. I mean, if you mm -hmm. just measure perception of effort during a race, mm -hmm. and people can, you know, have a decent way to pace themselves and stuff. I mean, doing a marathon, the, the perception of effort is probably the same for everybody. Okay, perfect. What's the difference? The speed at which they, exactly <laughs> at which that perception. Of, you know what I mean? It, right. But the the. But the reason why, the, so as I said, you need to think about perception of effort for a given workload. The reason why the top athletes can, for the same effort, run much faster, complete the marathon, let's say, in, in two hours and five minutes, whatever, instead of you struggling to get under three, mm -hmm. it's because the perception of effort for a given speed is much lower in, in the top part. You know what I mean? You exactly. need to change it. Also, because we know you don't, you don't, they don't give you medals for your relative effort. They give you medals for the absolute <laughs> work that you are able to do. Exactly. <laughs> and I guess, again, uh, back to another Twitter question. Now, who was this one? Andy King. And it, it's just relating to what you're talking about here. The question is, you know, I'd love to know what separates those who pass the SBS team, uh, like selection exercises versus mere mortals. How do they keep going when they're exhausted? So this is like the, the SAS or the, you know, the SEAL training ah. or whatever. How do some of these people keep going? Some people obviously can push harder. So it's the same sort of thing. How is it that some people can push harder? So I know you said in the marathon, and it's a good point and it makes sense. Everyone's at the same rating of perceived exertion probably, but some can push harder or is that, is that not true? You know, what does it take the ones yeah. that can push through that? Well, when depends what you mean by pushing harder. Mm -hmm. So the, you cannot push beyond what you perceive to be your truly maximal effort. So how you feel, and that's something you can control to a certain extent, but for example, me, I can use all the techniques I know to reduce perception of effort. If you put me on a treadmill at 20 kilometers or 21 kilometers per hour, mm -hmm. that keep choggy, and it's going to feel 10, if you go to 10, 10, uh, after 30 seconds, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, it, I'm, not, I'm not a marathon runner at all. So I will, so you, you, there are things that you, you can control to a certain extent, but, and that will, that will improve your performance, but your level of fitness, that, that's the key, okay, in terms of determining that. However, and that's where maybe there can be some further differences between people. Hmm? The main difference is going to be this perception of effort for whatever workload that you're doing. Is when you get to the point, when you get to really, really very hard effort, what you per because we know from a lot of studies that at that point, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, reserve, both from a bioenergetic point of view and a, a also neuromuscular point of view. So physiologically, when people stop exercise, a task failure, exhaustion, point of fatigue, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. When they stop, when they are no longer, or I would say they feel that are no longer able to, to continue, is, and I'm talking about endurance exercise, okay? I'm not talking about that there's different stories with, with the strength and power, short bouts. That's a different story. But with the, with the endurance exercise, you stop where you could have kept going for longer physiologically. That, there are also mm -hmm. studies showing that. So what determines the person that goes a little bit further in, into? I think that's where what we would call self-efficacy and 
your interpretation of the feelings of your body as okay i really pushed to the my really maximum limit and when you feel like that when you think and, and you feel like that you're gonna stop that's where you, i think the 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 mindset if you like uh, let's call it like that um could make a, a a bit of a change but you cannot your perception of effort will it will be the primary and which is something you cannot control uh to a large extent will dictate when you stop that that kind of mindset may make you gain a little bit more but it's not gonna make uh you know if after 10 minutes at uh whatever at 300 watts you feel your rp is 10 okay mm -hmm. the, the, the let's say the tough guy <laughs> this kind of you know that, that's they're called the mental tough although i don't like that okay they may last maybe another 20 seconds 30 seconds a minute but they're not gonna last uh, an hour, you know. Sure. If they reach, they're, it's 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 a professional cyclist. Three hundred watts after ten minutes, gonna feel like I guess five. It's the, <laughs> it will keep going for for a long uh, three hundred watts forever. So it's 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 uh, it's the, this mental toughness, this motive. This, I think it's overrated. Okay. Um, so yeah. so you think basically most people are going at the same as you said same rating of perceived exertion it's just that they're fitter there's not a whole lot there you think of the extra you know you say oh this guy this person's got a lot of ticker a lot of heart they can push themselves uh, you know beyond other yeah people. no i mean Everything. of course if somebody is not motivated then motivation it it it, it will mm -hmm. um limit your performance. I mean, if you're willing to give uh, uh, an effort of zero to 10 of six, and you stop when you feel six, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you're not going to last as much as somebody else as fit as you that is uh, willing to exert up to a, an effort exactly. of 10, which is maximal effort. However, in, in those situations, most people are willing to exert a maximal effort. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, 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 the thing is that uh, when they reach a point where they believe that they are not able to continue uh they will give up there may be people that uh, same with frame they they the psychologists they they frame the same sensation in a different way which they they, they, they make their self-efficacy better and therefore give a little bit of an advantage compared to somebody else but in this kind of task where they have to do a task for a long time the task is pretty standard the person that will last the longest is the person that either because it's fit there or also, you know, I think there are in the inter-individual differences, maybe in the brain. And anyway, is the guy that will perceive that task to be less helpful to the, the, the guy next to him. What about, what about experience? Because I was thinking about my, my mum. We had this thing called the City to Surf here. Oh, it still is. It's a 14-kilometer race in Sydney. And I know when my mum and her friends did it, that they just hadn't really done any exercise really before. And I don't think they know, you know, it's almost like the, the child, you know, it goes out too fast. They just, they didn't really know, you know, their idea of being tired at the end of it was, you know, just walking the whole way and not even trying to run. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And what about this experience? Like if someone that's, that's, that's done so many hard races and has just, you know, just gone harder than they ever thought they could, they they start to learn that that is they can yes. push themselves a bit harder. Absolutely, no, that that's yeah. that's for sure, and therefore they're able to um, interpret those feelings in a let's say in a more positive way, and that enables them to truly believe. No, it's not just it's not enough to <laughs> you you cannot fool yourself, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. not that you can just say it's just saying oh, okay no i can i can keep going i can do it it can help that but you need to truly believe that you can otherwise you cannot lie to yourself right and and if your belief about well when i feel this way I, i'm actually not really 100 percent exhausted I, I, I can do a little bit more that comes with the spirit you can push a little bit but again it, i think the magic Oh, it could be very important in competition. Eh? I'm not saying, but it's not going to last another 10 minutes or another. You know what I mean? When you get yeah. to the point where it feels oh, absolutely, yeah. hard and, and you want to keep, keep, you want to keep that pace, you're not going to last another half an hour. Okay. It's not, it's just not on yeah. the card. You may last a little bit longer. Maybe that makes you, uh, you break your opponent. The opponent will give up, completely give up. 
and because it sees you that you can actually, and then you win the race. I mean, I, it can be the difference between winning and losing. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, you're not, you're not going to break through the, the, the psychological limit that is given by this perception of effort. Just back to the, the the Andy King question about the going through the the SAS type training or something. So, I guess it gets more and more complicated the more you. you so, for example, he's talking about things where you go through like horrific experiences. If you know you've got to mm -hmm. go underwater and hold your breath as long as possible, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and all sorts of things, they have to run with packs on for thirty miles, and then the and, and then some people don't make it. And then the next day, you do it again. The next day, I guess he's asking, you know, what what is it? The people that sort of make that is it just that they're fitter um you know well, actually, it's sometimes it's experience been, as well right yeah like, i mean i work with the military mm -hmm. i mean obviously they are deaf you know if you're in special forces you're fit but mm -hmm. some of them are not exceptionally you know what i mean they're very fit people to put the last two days in. <laughs> because i think that is exactly i mean i'm i mean nowhere near right but you know, when I was young, there was a military conscription in Italy. Mm. I spent one year in the army mm. after my bachelor degree. I mean, nowhere near. You know, <laughs> but it's 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 still a very interesting experience. Is the the it's a psychological training, really? I think that mm. that which gives you the experience that you can. Of course, if you're one of those that actually uh, manage, because of course, very high motivation, maybe also some genetic, because uh, psychology, uh, almost every trait in psychology uh, studied um, has a very strong genetic component. Let's not forget about that. I mean, the psychology, it's, it's a biological, it's a natural phenomenon. It's not consciousness, you know, what we call psychology, mind. It's I, the way I see it, of course, I'm a scientist. It's not like some sort of <laughs> something detached from, from, from biology. I mean, it, it's biology uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and just that expressing it at a different level of um, a subjective level. But the, so there are very strong genetic components here as well. But of course, experience can, and that's what they're doing is, first of all, it's natural selection during the process, but also make you experience uh, that, yeah, when you feel that, I don't know, you're completely run out of air, actually you're not dead. <laughs> you can call mm -hmm. it. And of course, I mean, that is going, so next time it happens, you know, you're going to be less scared about it and you'll be able to maybe calm yourself down a little bit and then you're able to stay a bit longer than somebody else mm -hmm. who has not received that kind of training. It's, 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 it's yeah. It's, and it's uh, resilience. Ecological training is not. Uh... <laughs> the word often used nowadays is resilience, isn't it, as well? Yeah. Um, yes. Huh. Yes. You know, the other thing I thought of, you know, I said I, earlier a couple of things I thought of and I didn't want to forget about. You know, when you said you start a race, you know, your, your rating of perceived exertion will be less. And then the further you go. I always remember when I used to be a 10K runner, the perception, I think it must have been the adrenaline or something, is when mm. you start a race and you're all psyched up, mm. you go through and I go, holy crap, I've gone mm. through the first kilometer. That's why most people uh, screw up the pace. Yeah, I think that's one of the main reasons why people screw mm. up the pace. Exactly. And and that's why you have to be to I think in order not to run too fast at the beginning of a of a race, mm -hmm. you have to be very disciplined, have a, a lot of tries in and really look at your well these days at your Garmin or <laughs> in the in the old days at the time at because it's very easy to go too fast. Because of that, because of the excitement, the distraction, there's the, the opponents, a lot of things that will re actually reduce your perception of effort. So yeah. if you if you just go and uh, you go guided by your perception of effort, you go faster. However, going faster has an effect on your muscles and perception of effort. And I actually did the st my first study, actually, where I mentioned the psychobiological model was a study about m muscle fatigue. Okay. Because I proved the muscle fatigue is not the limiting factor, it's not what makes you stop. You don't, do not stop because your, your legs are unable to keep that pace. Although it feels like that, physiologically, your legs are able to continue at that pace. However, that doesn't mean the fatigue is not important. Muscle fatigue is important, not because it's the limiting factor, but because if you run at a given speed with fatigued leg muscles, your, your perceptual effort is going to be higher mm -hmm. for different physiological reasons. 
So mass of fatigue is a, is is affects the U.S. performance bec- not directly, but because it affects perception of effort. So if you run too fast because you're feeling very good at the beginning of the race, you are distracted, you are the adrenaline rush, uh, you see your opponents going, and you just okay, you do I don't know five kilometers like that. That will have a consequence of your muscles. Mm-hmm. For example, you have, you know glycogen that will induce muscle fatigue maybe later on, which will increase your perception of effort later on. And then you, <laughs> that's the wall, right? I mean, that's where you say, oh, fuck. And then you are, sorry, uh, sh- uh, you have to, <laughs> to, to, to slow down um, because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you went too fast, too much. But I didn't feel too fast. Okay, so right? I'm trying to, I'm just trying to put together something. So, because I read, you're saying uh, feedback, so sensory feedback is not mm-hmm. playing a role mm-hmm. in your pacing. But I, didn't you just say then that it is? Because so the fatigue it's, in the muscle. It's based on the neurophysiology of perceived research. A lot of people, well, um, I think it's changing, uh, it's changed. Um, or they, yeah, they, they change names to things. Um, but a lot of people, f- thought and still think um, that perception of effort is based on afferent signals from the body, from your mm. you know, lactic acid in your muscle or some signals from the heart or something like that. So also the center governor model uh, kind of postulates that. And however, that doesn't fit. I mean, that, that would be perfectly fine with you. Actually, it would be easier to study if it was like that. <laughs> But it's not, and there are a lot of studies showing. Uh, we actually re- very recently published with Ben uh, Benjamin Pajot, uh, a former PhD student of mine. He, um, they did a systematic, so a meta analysis of um, spinal uh, blockade studies. So where they use uh, anesthetics to st- stop or re- or greatly reduce the afferent feedback from the legs to the brain. Mm-hmm and measure perception of effort. Normally, actually, these studies are not designed to do that, are designed to study, I don't know, the, cardio, the effect of afferent feedback on respiratory responses, cardiovascular responses, right? So and, is your, I think your microphone might be rubbing on your beard oops, or something. It's starting to make... Okay, great. Thank you. So what I'm saying is, these studies, most of the time, has, has been done not to study perception, but they've been done for other reasons, like, for example, studying the effects of afferent feedback from the muscle in terms of cardiovascular response, for mm-hmm. example, during exercise. And it's funny, actually, those are the old studies. They use perception of effort as a measure of center. No, as you know, you know um, uh, there are many, many, many inputs to the cardiovascular center that makes you increase your artery, for example, during exercise. But two main ones, one is the exercise pressure, effect, so the afferent feedback from, from the muscles. The other one is center command. So the, the neural drive, the drive your muscle also drives stimulate uh, cardiovascular centers in control yes. centers in the medulla to increase, for example, heart. And this has been known for a long time. In fact, they were using RPE as a measure of center motor diet because they assumed, because the very first theory about perception of effort, perception of effort, the sense of effort was that he originated, I'm talking about before Sherrington, eh? this is old, old stuff. They thought, which is actually true. <laughs> the original theory is actually the correct one. The perception of effort, the, the, the signals for perception of effort are color discharges of your center motor command. So what you perceive as effort is how, basically how hard your brain is, is trying to drive, not even doing it because if you have a spinal lesion, you wouldn't have muscle recruiter, but just how much your brain is trying to send signal to your leg muscle, for example, if you're cycling, to, to recruit them. So the harder you are, you are um, trying, at, even just trying to drive your muscle, the more perception of effort you feel. Okay. And that's, by the way, that's why if you cycle, for example, run with fatigue muscle for the same speed, you will feel more effort. One of the reasons is because you are fatigue muscle, you have to keep the same speed. In order to do that, you have to increase muscle recruitment, right? So the... Um, these afferent feedback signals, when they're blocked with the epidural anesthesia, they don't, uh, perception of effort stays the same. Okay, okay. Pain, of course, pain. I mean, I mean, you, they can take your, cut your knee out, put a new knee in, and you don't feel a thing. 
It's because mm. pain is, including as a size induced muscle pain, the burning sensation, that's not effort though, that's pain, mm. that's feeling. That feeling is generated by afferent signals from, 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 in this case, from nociceptors or metaboreceptors in the muscles, right? Okay. But effort is not. And effort and pain are two different sensations. Eh? Okay. So just to summarize for people, because some people might get lost there with the afferent feedback sort of business. <laughs> so we talk about eff effect is, is, is sending messages from the... the um, oh, I have a good it? analogy, Glenn, mm -hmm. for the lay people. I have a, a, good, a great mm -hmm. analogy for this. Imagine your body is a, is a horse okay. and your brain is the jockey, you call it, right? The, the, the guy on mm -hmm. the top of the horse, right? Your perception of effort is not, are not signals from the fatigue horse, the, 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 right? The horse is fatigued and send you some sort of signals that you interpret as effort, no. But of course, if your horse is fatigued, it will slow down, right? Mm -hmm. In order to keep the pace, what do you do? What do the jockey? Well, they, he lashes, they, they the, he lashes the horse more. Mm -hmm. What you perceive as fatigue is how strong the jockey is lashing the horse. That's what you perceive, as, sorry, not as fatigue, as effort. And of course, because at the end of the race, you have to, your brain has to <laughs> lash your body harder, you perceive more effort because the, 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 the horse is, the, your body is fatigued. So it needs to be lashed harder. It's not only that, there are other things. Perception mm -hmm. of effort is always, uh, uh, any perception is much more complex than just this, the intensity of the stimulus, of the signal. But that's what the, that's what the signal is: is how hard your brain is is trying to drive your muscles. Okay, so you're saying it's not that. So that as the muscles are fatiguing, it's not the fatiguing muscles that are making it harder for you because you've shown that by blocking the feedback. It's the fact that you have to send more message messages from the brain to those fatigued muscles, and you're able to perceive that as your uh, perception of effort. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, and you're saying yeah. that's what they were saying many years ago. And that's what you think is correct now. Then Sherrington found a lot of receptors in the muscles <laughs> and everybody thought, ah, oh, oh, there are receptors. So all this sensation related to the muscle, they must come from the muscle, from the receptors in the muscle, which they do. And many sensation, most sensation are coming from the muscle, from other, you know, uh, receptors it, in the body. But perceptual effort, no. Then again, I was just thinking though, back to the, when you're uh, more endurance trained, Mm -hmm. You're able to go faster for the same perceived ex exertion. So mm -hmm. you've got the f more feedback from the muscles in terms of because they're actually contracting more and the joints are moving more and things. Mm -hmm. But you're actually also having to send more messages to mm -hmm. the muscle. Exactly. Right? But it's still the same perceived exertion. That's why, that's one of the reasons why at relative intensity, the effort is, perception of effort is very similar between, it doesn't matter how fast you go. You know what I mean? It's no, but you are having to intense. send. But you are having to send. Just to get it straight in my head. But you mm -hmm. are having to send more messages from the because we were just saying the number of messages from the no, brain. No, no. You send. Your... Let's say from zero to one hundred. You send. Let's say you go at seventy percent ah, of your okay. maximum effort. Okay. It, it's kind of kind of. You're it's not, not saying it's the that. Ab... It's seventy percent yeah. of your central motor command. Of course, your body though. Your the, instead of uh, lashing or lashing, right? Lashing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, 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 a bad horse, you're lashing a purebred uh, Arabian, whatever. Of we course, you, you lash the same, but uh -huh. the, the speed is different. <laughs> okay, I get you what you're saying now. For a minute, I thought because you're actually sending more messages to go faster it, when you're endurance trained, because you've got to, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing more stuff, but you're just saying you've got you've got more that you could could send still. Do you know what I mean? Like, even though you're sending more absolute messages from the brain. It's easier because you've got more reserve. Mm. Yeah, but I think I don't think you send more messages. But it's just your body though. responds. Your 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 lashing. The drive is the same. Is the the output of your body because it's trained that is better. However, that's in terms of the leg muscle. Something that I, I want to brief briefly mention, but because I, I can talk for another hour just about that. Mm. Uh, let's not forget the overall perception of effort, which is the one that. It's important to regulate the pace. It's not just about the feeling of effort in your legs, for example. No. It's also very important the feeling of uh, respiratory effort the, or the dyspnea, uh, exercise induced. So, 
which is very uh, running, for example, it's just like many endurance sport is very important. In fact, we found that we did some studies, actually, the, 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 the physiological measure that best correlates with perception of effort it's not oxygen consumption, it's not lactate, it's not heart, it's actually, it's not even ventilation, actually. it's breathing frequency. Right. So it, 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 there's also a, 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 an important respiratory component to this overall perception of effort. So for example, and that's also, I think, one of the mechanisms for which, for which training can reduce perception of effort, because of course, if you are trained for the same absolute power output, or also for the same oxygen consumption, your breathing frequency, uh, your ventilation overall, but especially your breathing frequency will be less, mm -hmm. much less. That's one of the reasons why people who are trained perceive less effort. It's not just the, because their legs are uh, less fatigable, more powerful, it's also because of the breathing, which relates, of course, to metabolism. That's so we found a connection, mm -hmm. Glenn, at the end. <laughs> there you go. That's interesting as well, because I remember we, when we were doing rating of perceived exertion, sometimes the participants would say, well, hang on, do you mean my legs? Because, you know, when you're cycling, it's really intense on your quads. Mm -hmm. Or do you mean my whole body? And so then we actually started doing that. We'd have like a, a leg rating of perceived exertion and then sort of mm -hmm. like a whole body rating mm -hmm. of perceived. And they weren't always the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I know we're getting a bit long in time here, but I did want to ask, and there was a question again on Twitter, uh, Pierre uh, Paquette how to adequately adequately prepare mentally for endurance sport so it made me think about so overcoming pain etc it made me think about you've had papers about brain training mm -hmm. is that did you want to? yeah that's that's uh something that uh actually we are uh, publishing more papers so a group in birmingham so it's being replicated by other groups which is always good in science that's not the yes, the, yes. the results because to be honest I couldn't even, even believe in myself, actually. <laughs> so it's good that somebody else <laughs> replicate. Um, yes, that, but that's a bit more advanced. But I, I will talk about that. I think but I can give you something that is very actionable. So the first thing to do is to, when you prepare for a competition, of course, it's important that you go, you, you arrive at a competition um, with no muscle fatigue, no muscle damage, right? So, of course, and that's you do by tapering the training, et cetera, right? Mm. It's also important that you don't get mentally fatigued at the race. Because we, we have shown that mental fatigue can reduce your, can increase perception of effort and reduce per, endurance performance. So the first thing I, I would say is try to reduce your kind of mental, which is much easier said than done, especially with people who are very anxious. Try to reduce the mental workload you know, the, the, the day before the competition or the morning of the competition, even stupid things like having to take care of the logistics mm -hmm. of a race, like a triathlon, for example, which I, I used to, to train a, a guy who was very, very good. I shouldn't try. The, the, the logistics are horrendous of the sport, you know. That the, and so for a, stup a, a stupid thing as like, okay, let's try to get the logistics to somebody else or... Do not drive yourself to the, don't, don't do a long drive to, um, try to sleep because, okay, sleep is important. But actually, one of the reasons I think why sleep reduces performance, there is a direct effect, of course. But another one is that not many people know is that when you're sleep deprived or sleep restricted, you get mentally fatigued quicker. Okay, okay. So, so sleep also reduces the mental fatigue. In fact, some people okay. talk about the cognitive effects of sleep deprivation, they call it mental fatigue even. I don't, I don't think it's exactly the same, but if, you're, if you are sleep deprived, sleep restriction, you, you will get more mentally fatigued the day of the day. So again, good sleep hygiene, try to reduce the mental workload before a competition or even during a competition, no? uh, like by zoning out, for example, in certain phases, etc. The other one is, uh, well, one we mentioned already, uh, caffeine uh, is very effective in reduces perception of effort. Um, again, you have don't, never try new things before a competition, like every supplement, any other strategy, try it uh, beforehand, try to find, I mean, most people with the three milligrams per kilogram of body weight about, uh, again, it depends the duration of the race, but uh, so about half an hour, an hour before the race, if the race is relatively short, it's, it's, it's 
most people will get a benefit from it. Some people may need more, some people may need less if they're sensitive. It's more difficult than caffeine with the very long races, something that we need more research on it, how, when it's best to take it and also during the race, etc. But in general, caffeine, yeah, will uh, be useful. The other one is if you can find a good sports psychologist that can teach you some psychological skills such as self-talk, um, goal setting, imagery, those kind of things, uh, which can be um, tailored to endurance athletes and used uh, before or during races. Uh, we found them, uh, many studies now found them effective. Um, it's not ideal, but you can also maybe, you know, get a book about, uh, there is one, uh, the ed uh, editor is Carla Main, talk about these things. Uh, or maybe you can try to learn from a book, um, this mental uh, psychological skills, sorry. Uh, it's better, I guess, to work with a psychologist. And again, these things also try them in training, not just, you know, try them for the first time because actually they can actually increase the workload if you don't get used to them. So, and um, the other one is, okay, we're talking about this brain endurance training. The idea is that there is not just a physiological load of the training session that determines your improvement in performance is also the psychological load. So if you increase the psychological load of a training session, you are increasing the overall training load of that session, even if physiologically it's exactly the same, which can be a good thing. So it could be a way to increase workload on the brain specifically without increasing the physical load, especially with runners that can get overusing, you know, very elite, for example, runners where you get you get to the limit where you start to get injuries. It could be a good a good thing to to use brain endurance training to further increase the work without putting stress on your musculoskeletal system. Uh, but also can add the variety so that um, you can make a, a training session um, reduce the workload even taper physiologically without reducing the overall training load. However, it's training load. Mm -hmm. So it can also cause overtraining. So you need to it's it's you need to see it as part of the overall training load. But we demonstrated that by uh, equating the physiological train, the physical training load, that if you add the cognitive load to the session, uh, the, the ones I did uh, primarily were uh, are doing some demanding cognitive tasks during training. So this can be done, to be honest, with cycling for sure, only during, um, uh, you know, a roller, you know, indoor training. With running now, we develop an app. It's not commercial available. We developed an app with the MOD, with the, um, so you get um, sounds, stimuli sounds uh, on, you know, do, with your uh, ear, um earphones and you can do that and respond with a clicker on your finger. So you can do this when you run outside. Um, so, but you can also add the cognitive load before. There are now studies showing that also before the session or immediately after the session. Well, it seems to that if you do the cognitive load and you're, saying, cog you're to, saying cognitive load, is that right? Cognitive? Yes. Yeah, I thought you were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Any mentally demanding task uh, would yes. do. But it has to be either immediately before, immediately after, or during. If you do it completely separate, it doesn't seem to be very effective. Um, another one is not proven scientifically that it works, but you know, you can try, is to training in a mentally fatigued state is not necessarily a wasted training session. Like some people do, and maybe they maybe skip it because I'm tired today. I'm not gonna have a good training session. Maybe I skip the training or do. Actually, from a brain point of view, training in a mentally fatigued state may be a good thing. From in in terms of increasing, let's say, resistance to mental fatigue. Let's say, of course, if you want to maximize the stimulus to your muscle or your cardiovascular system, you want to do the opposite. You want to train as fresh as possible because mentally fatigued will reduce the intensity that you can reach during training, okay? So again, you can use either reducing or increasing the mental cognitive load of training, uh, depending on what kind of goals you have for that training session. But training in a mentally fatigued state is not necessarily 
a wasted session. It could be actually be a good session to develop a resilience, let's say a resistance to, to this, this state, which seems to affect endurance performance. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, you know, depending on what you want. So, you know, sometimes people say, I wonder if I should train low, you know, so you've got low carbohydrate on board when you train, yeah, yeah. Or train exactly. high, it depends on what you want. Exactly. And you're exactly. probably getting something out of it either way. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, training in an optimal, always in an optimal state is not, doesn't seem to be, you want to train also in a suboptimal state, which has been tested, as you know, in terms of physio, uh, suboptimal physiological state, for example, with glycogen deprived muscle. But mm -hmm. I think it, 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 it also works with, it should work um, also in, uh, for, for the brain as well. Actually, I think I've, I've, I think you may have uh, helped me out with this question I've had. So again, with Mark Hargraves last week, I did my PhD with Mark Hargraves, and we had this study where we had people come in and exercise to exhaustion, so time to exhaustion at the same workload, mm -hmm. and they had placebo or carbohydrate, no randomized. Mm -hmm. And this guy went three hours on placebo, so they're getting no carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And then when he had the carbohydrate one, um, we, we, he'd done the placebo first. So we kind of had an idea he'd go longer. So we thought about an hour and we'd get the doctor to run over from across the street to do the biopsy. And he ran over and then he went back and he ran because he kept going. He went five and a half hours, right? And um, it's 70% to a VO2 max to exhaustion, which is pretty impressive. But anyway, the point was we started thinking because we did actually studies like when we did biopsies, you know, just at the point of fatigue and we couldn't see any changes in, you know, in metabolism and the, when they fatigued, which is kind of what you were alluding to earlier. And, and then we're just like, why, why does he, why did he actually fatigue? You know, he's, he wasn't dehydrated because he drank fluid throughout his, his glucose was maintained the whole way because he, he drank. So we're like, why did he fatigue? So naturally the rating of perceived exertion continued to increase until we eventually stopped. But why, you know, why, you know, what's, ah. is it recruiting, having to recruit more and more motor units? Yeah. Is that maybe what's. Yes. But that, I think that works better for, um, special intensity there is a link there also for lower intensity because it's been you know i'm sure you're aware of these studies which i find them very interesting that we always thought exhaustion related to glycogen depletion as the inability to maintain the metabolic but because you, you start to oxidize more fats we know uh, you know the, the mm -hmm. metabolic power of <laughs> and the efficiency and also the power of burning fats is lower than burning carbohydrates. So therefore, if, when you don't have much carbohydrates, you have to rely more on fat. You are not able to produce the metabolic power required to maintain the, the, the power output, right? However, and that doesn't, again, doesn't seem to be the case. What seems to be the case is that when you are, which may maybe also explain maybe the wall, you know, doing a marathon, is that the glycogen also has a structural role is the, the granules are very concentrated around the triad. Mm -hmm. When your muscle glycogen stores are very low, your excitation contraction coupling is impaired. Mm -hmm. So actually maybe more like a neuromuscular effect, not a bioenergetic effect of low glycogen. So then when the glycogen is very low, your excitation contraction coupling processes are impaired. And therefore, again, you have to increase your drive in order to maintain the same speed that will reflect, that will be reflecting an increase in perception of effort. However, although muscle fatigue, including the reduction in excitation contraction coupling due to muscle glycogen depletion, I think it's an important and big contributor to the increase over time in perception of effort during exercise is nowhere near the, the only one. Uh, ventilation, again, that's more high intensity because if you measure ventilation in moderate intensity exercise may stabilize, yeah. that doesn't increase. Mm -hmm. uh, tachy, the way people breathe may uh, change. So they may, may become more tachypneic. That will increase your perception of effort even for the same ventilation. Um, and with increasing body temperature over time, that increases your tachypnea, that may be related to it. But I think that for moderate or low intensity exercise for very prolonged time, I think one of the main reasons why perception of effort increases over time is our changes within the brain, possibly also the spine, that um, 
you have to increase again the, the the activity of the motor even the actually it seems to be the more the pre-motor the supplementary motor area the pre-motor areas in order to keep going so it would be some sort of like in they say intrinsic fatigue of the central nervous system more than the periphery although the periphery with what the, what we discussed earlier will have an effect but it could be some sort of due to of course continuous usage prolonged usage of uh you know continuing generating action potential for you know for the motor drive them actually and and adenosine accumulation for example that's why caffeine works may be a culprit uh, there may be some problems with the neurotransmission especially in the dopamine dopaminergic system things within things that change over time when you exercise within the certain nervous system itself but we don't know that very much it's speculation at this point Actually, that just reminded me of uh, years and years ago. I think it was J. Mark Davis was you're talking about dopamine. Remember, mm -hmm. there was this idea with the serotonin would mm -hmm. would, would build up. Of course, of so if course. you had the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, mm -hmm. I found in rats, I think they ran, ran better mm -hmm. and then humans. And there was yeah. this idea that carbohydrate ingestion might affect yeah. serotonin. I yeah. think that kind of went chain out amino acids, those kind of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, right. because I think. I mean, I understand why it went down the serotonin route, mm -hmm. because one of the main symptoms of depression, which of course is more a serotonergic disorder, is fatigue mm -hmm. and lack of motivation. So when people that think in a neurochemical way, often link, you know, the, the people that work with depression and stuff, they thought, oh, it must be serotonin. But now there is actually, there is a very, interesting line of this research in animal you know, psychopharmacology and basic uh, behavioral neuroscience it's called effort-based decision making which is actually what the <laughs> uh, what, what the psychobiological model basically is an effort-based decision making mm -hmm. model really <laughs> um they study effort-based decision making behavioral of course in animals and they they do all sorts of fancy things to the brain of these poor rats and all this research pinpoints to the dopaminergic nervous system, which can be also strongly modulated by adenosine, which is what is blocked by caffeine. That's caffeine. why caffeine has, mm -hmm. yeah. It so is. it's not the serotonin. That's why I guess that's why it did, never really worked because it, they, were, they, they were thinking targeting the wrong neurotransmitter. It's the dopamine that, that okay. seems to be the... The, so the, the adenosine one. with the caffeine affects the adenosine receptors. Is that dopamine? Dop it, it antagonizes um, adenosine. Uh, see, yeah, basically it, it binds to the adenosine receptor more strongly, but when it binds, nothing happens. So it antagonizes adenosine, basically. Exactly. And and aden what adenosine does, it reduces the excitability, postsynaptic excitability of the neurons. And dop Dopamine related neurons yeah. well every neurons to be honest but okay. the 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 dopaminergic new neurons so the neurons that you know communicate with each other with dopamine um they are very sensitive to adenosine there is even some co-localization of the adenosine receptor with the dopamine so it's, it's complicated but it's it's the two the adenosine is more it's not a neurotransmitter it's more a neuromodulator if you like but it seems to mm, have a very strong effect on neurons that are dopaminergic, which then code perception of effort, among other things. And that's why, I guess, why caffeine is so effective in reduces perception of effort. But again, it's one point or even less than that on a zero to 10 scale. Imagine having a drug. That would be my fantastic experiment. I'd probably never do that, never be able to do that. Imagine to have a super caffeine something that reduces your perception of effort by three four five points mm. actually i saw what would paper. happen I, I don't know <laughs> i saw a paper you know capsaicin so the what's in chile mm -hmm. there, there was something about capsaicin reducing mm -hmm. rating of perceived exertion during exercise how, how does that compare to caffeine and, yeah. and how's what's the mechanisms there do you know well i don't know exactly the i don't know whether they use it as a supplement or did they use uh, peripherally because that's another thing because actually you can use capsin to, yeah, in fact, it's used as a, a, an analgesic because it's, it, it begins to burn for that. <laughs> it's quite, you overload your pain receptors. It's actually, you can use it as, let's say, an anesthetic in a way. But that will reduce your exercise-induced muscle pain, which again, a lot of people, 
it does affect performance because it, it can affect perception of effort, but it does not directly limit your, your with exercise can be very painful. And we proved that, but it's not as painful as, for example, cutting your leg. You, you know what I mean? I mean, mm. you, unless you are a, 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 how do you say, I don't know how do you say <laughs> in Australia, unless you are really a pussy, you're not going to stop because the pain that you feel doing exercise is unbearable. You don't stop because it's unbearable pain. You stop because you feel that you cannot keep going. No, not because it's the pain, of course, the pain is, is, is strong and, and, and resisting the pain requires effort. That's, so being in pain will make your perception of effort very high. But you do not, st I mean, unless, okay, if you break a, an ankle or something, or you have a very a big blister, or, okay, that kind of pain, yes. But as, there's a size induced pain. It's not, I mean, it's strong, but it's not as strong as, you know, <laughs> it's, not, okay. it's not unbearable. This, this is not a stop. silly. This is probably a silly yeah. question, but but what about just reducing pain by taking a Panadol or something? <laughs> or, or well, they try to actually, they're not so effective. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but if you could reduce pain a lot, you may have a, indirectly also an effect on perception of effort, especially over a long, over a long period of time, because is the dealing with the pain is keep doing something that is painful. That requires mental effort. And I mean, keeping your, when you do the ice cold, you know, the cold oh. pressure test, so you put the, 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 your hand in a ice bucket and you keep it for as long as you can. Of course, then there you reach unbearable pain. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't require physical effort, does it? I mean, <laughs> it's mental effort. But it's very hard to keep the bloody thing when it starts to, to hurt, right? In in the icy back. So, but when we do exercise, it's, it's effort, a brain level, mental and physical, they're not that different, right? And so if, and a lot of the effort that you perceive doing exercise, actually, I think it's actually, also, it's not just the effort of purely driving, it's, it's the effort to deal with the pain, is the effort of dealing with the heat discomfort, if the effort keeping attention what your uh, opponents are doing is the effort keep you know looking at your watch looking at the dist you know the effort of regulating your pace you know when, when you look at it uh, from a more psychological perspective it's not just just driving your legs it's mental effort i mean indeed you i mean you can feel effort when you do something that is purely cognitive so it's it's it's, it's so maybe that's partly why people do better when they have a pacemaker in running obviously you absolutely get a bit, of, a bit of the breaking the the, the air Absolutely. But, but the, you don't have to think about it. Exactly. Exactly. It's like um, Alex Hutchinson of uh, formerly at, at Runners mm. World, now at Outside Magazine, Outside. also wrote, uh, if, if your listeners are, are interested in, okay, they, of course they can go online and find my papers, but, you know, especially for people that are not, uh, <laughs> they don't want to read the original <laughs> paper in June Apply or something like that, mm. I would suggest a couple of books which they have, cover a lot of my research but in a more accessible way one is endure by alice Hutchinson. the other one is uh, how bad do you want it by matt fitzgerald uh they have, both books are you know also entertaining and 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 accessible to so endurance athletes um uh, with uh, you know references to, to to science as well um but digestible and 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 I think that, that there would be a lot of inspiration to your listeners that, that are into endurance sports. I agree. I haven't read Alex's book, but I've said, read some of his pieces, and he was even nice enough to retweet one of my one of my episodes as yeah, well. Yeah. So he's a good lad. But he called that phenomenon you were mentioning cognitive drafting. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. What I was often do is just at the end, can we do a few takeaways? There's got quite a few takeaway messages here, but. Mm -hmm. I don't know, two or three, three or four sort of takeaway messages from the, that you'd like to get across. Yeah. One would be keep doing what you've been doing so far. Keep training, keep good nutrition because all those things reduce perception of effort, mm -hmm. but you can reduce perception of effort with other strategies above and beyond what, what you do normally with training and good nutrition. That would be, really the take-home message. Um, 
The other take-home message would be in preparation for a competition, make sure not that your, your body is well recovered and rested, that you don't have muscle fatigue, that you don't have muscle damage. Also make sure that your brain is fresh uh, before a competition. So make sure that try to reduce as much as possible any, any, anything mentally demanding, things even driving or having to think about logistics, try to reduce that and have a good sleep. That's, it's making me think about when I was a kind of a serious 10K runner, I just did all that wrong. I, I remember I'd always been a mad rush driving to the race or to training, and I'd be literally getting dressed in the car while I'm driving. And it's like, yeah. maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. yeah. The other take home message would be experiments in training or not so important races with the caffeine. Find a good dose for you that is not, that is reduces your fatigue, perception of effort without, you know, uh, causing any gastrointestinal problem, et cetera. The other one is either find a good sports psychology that can teach you some psychological skills such as self-talk, imagery, or read some books about those uh, psychological skills so that you can learn them yourself. Again, practice them during the training uh, because they will help you during the, during the race. That's great. Now, one thing I've realized, because I've got, again, endurance background, we tend to talk about endurance. Before I let you, let you go here, can we just think a little bit, what about people that aren't endurance? So if it's, you know, you're mm. a sprinter, you're a... A 400 meter runner or swimmer or whatever do these mm. things still pretty much apply mm. or no no okay i think when you when we are talking about i would say anything below 30 seconds mm -hmm. maximal effort which includes by the way i mean cycling races these days are almost uh <laughs> okay for the guys that can keep with the, top, the you know the 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 elite group until the end, it basically is a sprint at the end of a, an an endurance, mm -hmm. but that's a sprint race. Mm -hmm. So anything below thirty seconds, including the sprint finish, which by the way I think on average it, they last about 14, 15 seconds, so it's well below, well within that thirty seconds um, limit. I think because there's no pacing you go all out mm -hmm. okay. the, the the limit there is more clearly physiological um and of course i mean if you're tense i mean the psychological preparation uh, reaction time for a sprint uh, not being too tense. i mean the, the, there are a lot of things that you can do psychologically to improve performance but there is not through the perception of effort and not through this psychological model which i described that applies really to to endurance performance mm. okay so even though the perception of effort is very very high you're saying mm -hmm. you can't really change that with strategies or no i mean because you go all out you go your maximal effort and mm -hmm. what comes out which is primarily determined physiologically is, is what gonna determine um I guess they would still your, want to your, your, your performance mm. i guess they still would not want to have okay so you're saying Things like mental fatigue before it and things like that, they, they're not a, as much of a Yeah, we know, we either. did the study. So when you do things like a single jump or an MVC, if you, you know, five seconds, maximum voluntary contraction, those kind of things uh, are not affected. What we don't know, I should, a caveat. There are studies which are mainly in the context of fall prevention, <laughs> actually. Some Japanese people, some Chinese people, they, I think, read my study, they started to use the, the, this thing, you know, the inducing mentally fatigue experimentally to study things like um, how the, the body reacts to sleep, they induce a sleep and they look at your motor control. So there is some evidence, not so much in sport, that uh, motor control can be affected so even things like uh, like a high jump or Olympic weightlifting or things where there is a you know a big technical component, I think mental fatigue may affect mm. performance, but not by reducing your strength or your power by by um, impairing your motor control. And of course, mental fatigue is going to have a massive effect on uh, sports with a big cognitive component like I don't know, tennis or, or football or you know what I mean where you have sure. to make decisions react and stuff mm -hmm. but that's not, I mean that's that's about more the effects of mental fatigue but this thing that we're talking about the psychological model is is really anything that requires endurance also team sports because I mean <laughs> team sports require endurance and people take decisions whether 
to run or not, whatever, uh, based on that. So it, it's also applicable to a certain extent to, to, to team sports as well. But pure strength and pure power, especially those that don't have a big technical component, I would say no. Potentially, through mental fatigue, the ones that have a, a, skill, a skill component, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, nice to meet you. You're welcome. Thank you, Glenn. Okay. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to be honest, believe it or not, <laughs> I almost never listen to my own podcast and stuff. I guess okay. so bored. <laughs> but I, I will just to have a, you know, uh, maybe part of it. But I, I'll probably uh, end up listening more to the previous ones that you did more than the one I did. Oh, with there you, you go. I'm always interested yeah. in getting more views. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, do that exactly. as well. Okay. Uh, I don't like to hear my own voice, but uh, <laughs> I, I hope your listener will find it useful and thank you for having me i'm sure me. they will thank you okay, okay. see you thank you glenn goodbye all right Bye -bye. Ciao, ciao 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 i hope you enjoyed this podcast um please like subscribe pass it on to your friends and colleagues check out the other podcasts thanks again